Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and my new co-host, Wendy Dillard, here. Today is Tuesday, November 21st, 2017, and we are doing this as a special podcast to introduce Wendy to our audience. Wendy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Walt. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here, <laughs> beyond description. Um, hopefully, you'll hear that in the tone of voice and the things that I share, but, you know, you found me. I found you. It was a perfect co-creation. It's what I was looking for, even though I didn't know it's what I was looking for. Well, we like to start these podcasts with wins, recent wins, and this seems like a perfect way to start it because this was, like you say, it was a win-win. We found each other very serendipitously at perfect timing. So I don't know if you want to tell that as part of your wins, but why don't you give us a few wins that have happened lately? Well, I went to an Abraham Hicks workshop this Saturday. And I just kind of knew that when I – because every time I've been to one that's live, it changes my life. I didn't know how it would change it, but I knew it would. Now, how many have you been to? um, I've been to a cruise, a land cruise, and four workshops. Okay, now I'm officially jealous. (laughs) (laughs) How many have you been to, Walt? None. I haven't seen a single one yet. Oh, my goodness. Feel, oh, my goodness. I feel well, deprived. I, I've had a deprived <laughs> life. <laughs> well, maybe when next time they're in Connecticut, I'll head out there and we can meet in person and we'll both go to the Connecticut, Connecticut oh, one. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Because they do fun. one in Stanford every year. Yeah, that's true. They do, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So my, my cool win is that about a week ago, a girlfriend of mine, well, to even call her girlfriend seems kind of weird, but I met her at the Cancun Land Cruise a year and a half ago. And we connected, really not, we connected at the very end of the trip. We were in the airport, and we were like, hey, I know you. And we, like, spent about an hour together before planes took off. And since then, you know, there's been almost no communication. But she happened to pop in on my Facebook private chat saying, hey, I'm going to be coming through your part of town. Can I come by and see you? So I spent the day with her yesterday, and my life turned upside down. That to wow. me is such a win, and how how and why and what that means is that I shared with her what was going on in my life, and she amplified everything by witnessing, acknowledging, and adding to what she was hearing me talk about, and it literally like 10 x you know, everything I was already feeling, and now I feel like I'm on steroids because I'm just, <laughs> you know, like, oh! Everything that I'm looking for in my life just feels as though it's coming together. It doesn't mean that I'm seeing outward manifestation, but I'm feeling it. And I know that feeling it is actually step one of the manifestation process. So that to me is a huge win. Well, well, I'm going to actually beg to differ here because I think we are experiencing a manifestation. We connected. This is You know true. what I mean? I mean, the, you know, we, you're we, right. we're, we're starting you're, this you're, relationship here. So the manifestation is already happening. I was actually thinking of a different subject area in my life when I was saying that, but you're right. This is another one. I had three major life issues that I wanted answers to and movement in. And um, I was thinking about one having to do with body image and health, and that's the one that I don't necessarily see all of the manifestation stuff yet, but I feel it. Well, you know uh-huh. what? I should take that back. I do. I do. I am experiencing some. Oh my gosh, Walt! You uncovered something so brilliant for me. Okay. But I had Tell never us. recognized that I'm still looking for the big, huge manifestation before I can acknowledge it or say it out loud. Ah, yes, that's true. That, that, that's an easy mistake to make too. I know I've made that one many times because there are so many little things that happen that are good, and if we notice well, them, all of a sudden the big ones happen. <laughs> And, and really what I'm, I'm kind of recognizing even right now as I'm speaking is the changes in my life occur so quickly that I haven't caught up to where I literally am because that's how fast my life's moving. It, it's that's so the, easy to do that, too. It's so easy to just skip the stuff and say, well, that good thing happened. That good thing. Okay, now I'm onto this. Wait a minute. I got 25 good things that just happened. It, Yahoo! <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah, because I see movement in the, my, my health. I see movement in my career. And the only other one, I, I wanted to see movement in relationships. 
Okay. So I haven't physically seen that one, but that's one I can definitely say I've been having dreams of being in a relationship and feeling really? great. Oh, yeah, and I'm milking it. And <laughs> for, like, over a series, I would, like, be in certain circumstances, and I'd be in the beginning of a relationship, but I never saw his face. And then the last nope. dream I had, which was about 10 days ago, I finally was in a dream, and I saw his face. Oh, and somehow okay. for me, that meant movement was taking place. <laughs> well, milking it is a good thing. That's what I was going to say. And when you described that last bit to me, it reminds me of my own situation. Because Louise and I met when we were in our 40s. We married in 98. And it was at a time in our lives when both of us thought we weren't going to find anybody. Well, we did end up finding somebody. And after we'd been married for a few years, we reached a point, we, we, we had moved from Connecticut to Virginia. We were in Virginia for about uh, almost 11 years. And while we were there, at one point, I'd say like four or five years into it, there was an event, and I can't even remember what the event is. That's why I'm struggling and stumbling here. There was an event that happened within our relationship. And whatever that event was, it kicked something into gear. And I, I, it basically kicked a memory into gear. It reminded me that I had had a dream, a repeat dream, when I was in 17 to 18 range. And it was of being in a very close relationship with a girl who was very confusing because her hair color kept changing. <laughs> one moment she'd be blonde, one moment she'd be brunette, one moment she'd be white, one moment she'd be redhead. I mean, it, it was constantly shifting. It would be like light blonde, dark blonde. It was all over the place. And I didn't understand it. And I liked the feeling of the relationship within the dream, but it wasn't manifesting. It wasn't coming into my reality at all. Um, it wasn't until this event happened that I'm talking about in the first few years of our life together in Virginia that I realized that the face of the girl that I saw when I was 17 or 18 was my wife's. Mm. And it so took like 20 years really after having those dreams for her to show up. And what was the change in hair color about? She kept changing her hair over the years. <laughs> but like literally the face you know as Louise today yeah. was the face you were seeing back then? And, and it was more the face that I've seen of her as, in her pictures as a younger, uh, younger woman. And oh, I've that's seen that exciting. in her pictures many times, but I had never made the connection. You know what I mean? And then yeah. all of a sudden one day I made that connection, I said, and I started to cry. Because I, I said, oh, my God, it's the same girl. And I don't even know why it took so long for, for it to occur to me. I mean, it took like a good four or five years into our relationship before I realized that it was there. Mm. But once it did occur to me, I, I was almost uncontrollable. <laughs> I couldn't believe that <laughs> had actually happened. That's really, really exciting. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So it, it's not about the manifestation sometimes. Sometimes it's about what comes before it. <laughs> wow. And, you know, that's probably in the last year or so as I've been, you know, working more with understanding, you know, the work that Abraham Hicks does, um, I've really now come to – see, I used to think manifestation was you have to see it or experience it in a tangible way in our three-dimensional world. And that's oh, sure, I do. Hey, I still, I still feel that way. I mean, I know well, otherwise, and, but that doesn't stop me from feeling that way. But I think our conversation is letting me see – where I am and shifting that process, because what I've, what I've heard Abraham talk about a number of times now, and I know I'm working on incorporating this understanding, is that manifestation actually takes place first at a vibrational level. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get a sense of it, but we kind of can't really articulate it. And then as it like moves further along in the manifestation process, it comes to us either in a thought or a feeling because um, sometimes, I don't know if, which one comes first, but, like, you kind of catch one or the other. And for me, oftentimes, I'll catch a thought. Mm -hmm. And if a thought just comes to me where I wasn't, like, thinking about that subject, but, boom, it just shows up, I now recognize that as, oh, I'm in the beginning of the manifesting the things that I'm desiring. And then as I give a little bit more thought to it, then sometimes it shows up in a feeling, sometimes it shows up in a dream, and that, like, that's when I really know it's in manifestation process. And as long as I can stay attuned to focusing on it in a positive way without adding resistance, 
then it does start to manifest in a way that I can see it, taste it, touch it, feel it. Well, but, it you know, certainly matches. It matches what they talk about in their books, for sure, because they talk about how, and, they, and in the uh, emails that they send out, too, it, they talk about how you have a thought, and if you stick with that thought long enough and put some passion behind it or some emotion behind it, then another thought comes to you, and it leads to another thought, and then over time, these thoughts start to take form. They start to take shape, and that's pretty much what you're describing. You're describing that process, but you're also describing noticing it. And it's the noticing yeah. it that's really raising my eyebrows. Like, wow, that's really cool. And, you know, it's the noticing, or I call it having awareness of it, mm-hmm. that that has been a practice that for me has taken me time to develop. Because, oh, yeah. you know, I, I think we generally just have so many thoughts racing around in our mind that we don't stop and acknowledge them or pick them apart or notice what we're really thinking. They're just flying through our head. Mm-hmm. And I started yep. to make a conscious effort to capture them, <laughs> to like take, do a freeze frame, if you will, and go, what was that thought? You know, and, and I, we can't possibly do that, I think, for every single thought that flies through our head. But if there's something specific that I'm wanting to create in my life, I will kind of throw it out there like, hey, universe, do something that will signal me so that I will, like, notice when a thought does flow through so I can do a freeze frame and stop, notice it, and be aware of it. Because what I find is when I do have awareness of one of these thoughts, I, can get, I get so excited and happy because I allow myself to recognize I'm really in the 3D creation process now. Yes. And w- when I recognize that, I'm like, okay, so if I keep this going, I get to be a part of creating this in a way that I get to see. I like to be, I like to actually see behind the scenes. I don't, you know, I know some people are totally fine with just things pop up in their life and they're happy when they get it. I like to be a part of it because that's just my nature. <laughs> that, that's good though. I mean, my, my um, main co-host so far, David Bartke, um, he and I have talked about, you know, obviously similar stuff and I'm the one who is always trying to, you know, pick it apart and, uh, tear it apart and understand how this piece works and that piece works and that piece works. And for him, it's just, it works. Live with it. <laughs> and, you know, it, isn't that the beauty of the varieties of all our different personalities? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm the one who wants to go pull the curtain back and sit behind the wizard as he's moving the levers so I can see what he's creating on the big screen. Yeah, you and me both. And, and not only do I want to see how the wizard is creating it, I want to ask the wizard why he's not doing this as well and why he's not doing that as well. And why is that working out the way it's supposed to work out? But that one's not working out the way it's supposed to and all this other stuff. I mean, I'm constantly dissecting. It's crazy. It's a great way to drive yourself absolutely nuts. But it's what I do. And it's a great way to get questions answered. Hello. It is. That's true. (laughs) It is true. Having a curious mind is so incredibly important in this process. I think so. Yeah, because the, the curiosity is what drives us to learn more. And Absolutely. the more that we learn, the better we understand it. And the more that we understand it, the more we actually get to the point where we want to try it and apply it. In fact, that's what led to our podcast and what led to my doing podcasting as a whole. It, it's one thing. You and I talked about this when we were first talking with each other on the phone the other day, how um, it's it's so easy to just, you know, try it and it works and it doesn't, then, you know, okay, we'll just leave it at that. But the much harder thing is to really dive into it and make it part of your life. I think you expressed it in terms of you understood the concept, but you couldn't figure out how to make it work. Yeah, I, I didn't understand that's the, the issue application. So many of us have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the way many of us have to apply it is to, well, stumble around and apply it. <laughs> and if it doesn't oh, work, that means there's something not quite right there. So let's try again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I first started learning about law of attraction, I felt like I was adding to my knowledge base about, you know, personal personal development, self-help stuff. But I didn't really see it in the way I do now, where it's something that was really going to move the needle in my life in a huge way. Mm. Until, I, I mean, there came a point that I listened so much, and I was hearing how, like, other people who went to Abraham workshops were getting such – great answers and they were getting so many wonderful manifestations in their life it made me feel like hey how come that's not happening for me 
Yeah, you feel left what, out. That's the way it felt I did. for me with the first few times. Yeah. yeah. Perfectly said. I did. I felt left out. And I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta do something. Or, and, and I don't think it was that I had to do anything. That's how I was thinking. But sure. I know that it became a desire that was a huge thing that started to grow and grow and grow. My desire to know how to make this work, how to utilize it, because I understood that these principles were powerful. I just didn't quite know how to use them in my life. And so the more I listened to Abraham Hicks stuff, the more I went, I'm going to figure out how to master this because I know there there are some gems inside of this. And oh, then there are. I, I, I may have shared this with you the other day, but it, there came a certain point almost like, you know, when I hit critical mass with this new information and I felt a sense of hopefulness arise deep from within my being. And I used to, I was telling my friends, I'm like at hope on steroids. That's where I'm at in my <laughs> life right now. It's hope on steroids because it felt so big. And I didn't know where it was going to take me. But I had studied many different modalities in the self-help world, you know, trying to improve upon my own life experience. But I somehow knew when I landed on Law of Attraction that every answer I would ever need was somehow resident within these principles and if i could just figure out how to apply them it would change my world and it did so what are some of the ways that it has done that specifically in you know concrete terms in concrete terms um i would say oh gosh i went from being a gal who i was raised with a lot of debt i mean my family was in huge debt um, that's all I knew was to be in debt. I didn't know you could actually save for something and then buy it. <laughs> I only knew the credit card methodology. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I knew that through that credit card methodology, there was always going to be fighting because my parents, my great story, when I was little, I remember my mom had bought some new kitchen towels and she took the receipt and I watched her stick it under her jewelry box. And I said, Mom, why did you put it there? She goes, well, I don't want your dad to see it. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? She said, well, he pays the bills, and I don't want him to know about it. And I said, but won't he know about it eventually when the statement comes? She goes, yeah, but I'm willing to wait until that happens. But by oh, then, dear. the towels will be washed and dried, the tags are off, and I have to keep them. And I'm like, that's right. oh, <laughs> that's interesting. But there was. There was always, like, when the bills came, oh, my God, there was screaming and yelling in our household. And Mom trying to justify why she, should, why she bought something, and Dad saying, yeah, but now it's going to cost us and we don't have the money. So I grew up around the energy of lack of funds. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it has taken many years and it's changed in many forms, but I would say once I understood law of attraction, I started focusing in a way that I knew there had to be a way to live a life without debt. I didn't know what it was, but I was open to receiving new thoughts and ideas. Mm-hmm. And eventually I started playing game. Now, I love, I'm a kind of geeky and I love Excel spreadsheets, and okay. I started putting all of my debts in a spreadsheet. And I figured out certain formulas, and I'd plug in numbers like, well, if I paid this much per month, when would this debt be paid off? And over time, the game of getting out of debt became really fun and exciting to me. And I did get out of debt, like no credit card debt whatsoever. And now all I have left, I just have half of my mortgage left. And I know my plan is to have that paid off um, at least in the next four years, if not sooner. And every time I I come up with, like, a big expenditure, I always plan for paying it off in so much time or sooner. And Mm -hmm. the sooner always happens because I constantly focus on how fun will it feel to no longer have that debt. That's a really important thing, too, isn't it, the feeling part, the feeling part of what it feels like. Because you can also end up going the other way. And, and it's the way, obviously, you want to try to avoid, which is the feeling of, oh, my God, I'm going to stay in debt, and it just feels so miserable. That feeling component is critical. But that, that feeling of hope on steroids that I was referring to right. is what has helped me to, to know when I feel like nothing is going to work. I'm like, wait a minute. I know that there is, there is an answer within the law of attraction that perhaps I just haven't focused on or it hasn't come into my awareness, and I start seeking it. And it's not like 
I, I don't know how to even ask the question in a specific way, so I go very general, and I'll say, okay, what's the answer to this question? Or how can mm-hmm. I get a feeling of relief when it comes to my fi- finances? You know, because sure, there have been plenty of ups and downs in my life, but once I got to a certain positive state because my money situation was in a better place, now, okay, like here's something. Last year, my air conditioner went out, and to me, my air conditioner is my most important device in the whole wide world. Because well, especially I love since you it. live in Texas. I mean, in I Texas, in if you don't have an and, AC, and you're, in, you're in deep doo-doo if you don't have an AC that's working in Texas. <laughs> exactly. So I live in a two-story house, and I have two units, and when it was time to replace it, you know, my guy said, you'd be best off replacing them both with one bigger, better, better unit, and especially because you like it cold. And I said, okay. Then he gave me the price tag, and I nearly had a heart attack. $22,000. <laughs> Oh my goodness! I'm like, wow! Oh my word! But I got to tell you, I had a moment where I just asked my inner being, "Is this the right one for me?" And I got a yes, and I went, "Okay, I do not know how I'm going to pay twenty-two thousand dollars. I don't mm. have that." But I had two credit cards with zero balances, and they both had, you know, like if you do pay this off in twelve months, you know, it's zero percent interest, blah blah blah. So I did that. It only cost me $600 in interest total, but I set the intention. I'm paying these off before they go into, like, the high interest rate thing. Mm-hmm. And I paid those off in four days less than one year. Really? Yeah. That, now, that's a good where accomplishment. Did I, where did I come up with $22,000 extra? Dollars? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I really kind of sort of don't, but every single month I just kept focusing. It's kind of like, you know, in 12-step programs, they talk about, you know, one step at a time. Well, I kind of did one month at a time, one one month of making payments, and I wanted to – it's like it started to literally create momentum because month after month as I was seeing the payments come down, I wanted it gone because it, it was fun, concept of it was fun. Now, I don't know if this would work for other people. They might not think of it as fun, but math is fun for me. Numbers are fun for me. Excel spreadsheets are fun for me. So I was playing with these debts in the arena that brings me joy. I know that if sounds kind of wacky. That, that, that's a terrific gift to have, to be able to do that. I, I would gather and guess that most people – can't do it in that arena of joy like you do. The fact that you can is tremendous. <laughs> well, I've, I've taught two other people in my life my system for how to get out of debt, and one gal was in her mid twenties, and she was oh my, she had tons. I mean, bless her heart. At twenty five, she already had like thirty thousand dollars worth of medical debt. And medical debt, that, not her. student loan or something like that. Nope. Oh, she had student loans, too, but she had medical oh, debt. And <laughs> just to make it more debt. interesting. <laughs> yeah, she had every kind of debt. Oh, and she had no job. And, <laughs> <laughs> and within seven months, she had paid off three credit cards and knocked down half of her student loan. And she had, she had gone through three jobs, and she now had a really good paying job. But I taught her how to make it all fun. And a game, and I remember the first day we worked on, like, we set up a new budget for her because she'd never had a budget. And she did have need for some new clothes because now she had a job where she had to dress differently than how she was before. And I said, well, honestly, you can't go, you don't have the financial funding to just go out and buy a bunch of new clothes. So we put some money in her budget, and she loved to shop at consignment stores and thrift stores. She was a millennial, so, you know, buying hip and cool clothes that are retro was her thing. And she went out knowing that she went to her her thrifting one day, and she texts me, and she says, oh, my God, this is so much fun. I not only was able to buy the things that I had on this week's budget, but I also bought the stuff on the next following two weeks' budget, all within the same amount of money that was (laughs) plotted out for this week's paycheck. And she's like, I didn't think money could be fun. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of like, and now she's, you know, she, she's, she's left my tutelage, if you will. <laughs> and she's having fun with money. And she's living the freedom that she didn't know was possible because she didn't grow up with it either. 
I, I love that comment that she makes. I didn't know money could be fun, which tells us <laughs> volumes about what she was saying to herself about money before that and how exactly. you, you basically changed her whole internal dialogue about what, what money is about. That, that's a great and skill. Well, and you know what, Walt? I didn't know that that's what I had been doing until I shared some of my stuff with an adult friend. And she goes, Wendy, you turned it all into a game. And I went, huh? Mm -hmm. I thought I just turned it into Excel spreadsheets because I love them so much. She goes, no, it's all a game for you. And I went, you know, you're absolutely right. It is a game. It is. Sure. And that was actually something I heard Abraham say this weekend. When you turn it into turn anything into a game, you drop your resistance. That's true, actually. Now that I think about it, and in fact, I, I I can't say I was thinking about it in terms of it being a game, but that's what I've been doing with the idea of expanding this co- this podcast. Because up until I, I've been doing this podcast once a week now for. Let's see, we started in September 2012, my wife and I. I did a few interviews, it kind of fell off for a bit, and I started regularly around August 2013. So we're in November 17th, so about four and a quarter years now. It's been just once a week. And it's only in the last couple weeks or so, three weeks or so, that I've really started to give thought to the idea of expanding it, which, which is obviously how I reached out to you, among other people. I didn't really think of it as a game but really that's what i've been doing i've been playing a game here to see what will happen if i try to do this what will happen if i try to do that and the this and that are things like trying out blog talk radio trying out just reaching out to other uh people people who are um, life coaches and so forth to see if they'd be interested in being uh involved in something like this um which by the way that alone was an amazing thing wendy i don't know if i told you i've reached out in the past uh, few days or so, I reached out to 11 coaches. Of those 11, six have replied, five have not. Of the six who replied, three are interested and three are not. So in the course of one, two, three, four days, just by playing a little game, I have three people who are raring to go to do this podcast. Wow. And it it was just, let's see what happens. I I mean, there was no plan here. (laughs) So just, to kind of put some awareness around it for others who who might be asking some questions in their head right now, did you have any expectation as to what the result would be when you put this out to numerous coaches? Not specifically, but generally I thought it was going to be cool. Generally I thought it was going to be really good because I really did want to expand the podcast to be more than just once a week. I wanted to do it daily and preferably a couple times a day. So the the desire was really, really, really strong, and that strength of desire helped a lot. But in terms of how I thought it would work out, no, I mean, I really wasn't sure how it was going to work out. I just knew that it felt good enough to give it a shot, see what happens. <laughs> so <laughs> since you've been doing this for like five years, yeah. and you kind of started out, you know, at a slower pace with once a week, can you identify what it was that, allowed you to shift from once a week to I want more? Well, I think I've actually wanted it for quite a while. Um, David Barkey has currently been my co-host. Uh, he and I hooked up in May. Before that, it was Joel Elston who did it with me from November 2015 through early April of 2017 this year. And when Joel and I did it, we often talked about how great it would be doing how great it would be to be doing a daily radio show during drive time so this has been percolating for quite some time oh an interesting additional point here at the same time that i was reaching out to you and some other coaches um david very sadly his dog passed away on sunday and sunday is normally the day we record the podcast for broadcast on prn on thursday mm-hmm. so i needed to fill in the gap so to speak and I knew that we were going to have a call in because he had arranged to have somebody to call in. So I did the regular podcast, but I also reached out to my old friend, Joel. I said, Hey, Joel, I know you, you're, you're terribly busy. That's why you had to leave the podcast, but would you be interested in doing one just for today? And he got back to me and said, sure, let's do it tonight. So we set a time and we did it. And in the course of doing that, I found out he wants to come back. He wants to do more. Mm. And, and I, I reminded him about how we used to dream about doing the podcast during drive time as like a, a broadcast and getting people psyched up for their day and 
giving them their dose of positivity and so forth. And he said, I want to do it regularly now. I can't do it a lot, but let's take a day where you can you know, put me into your schedule. And I said, great. So there's just another example of how out of nowhere, something that I thought was actually closed off to me because because he has so many unbelievable things that have been going on in his life that I didn't think he'd ever be able to come back. All of a sudden, a door that I thought was closed has now reopened. So I guess what I'm saying here is I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew that I had been wanting it for a long time, and now that I started to take some steps, all of a sudden everything started to happen. So during the time you were wanting it, did you have doubts, or was it just kind of a fun thing to kind of roll around in your wanting oh i think if i'm really honest with myself deep back in my psyche i had very strong doubts about it but i was trying desperately to stay away from that and to just focus on how cool it would be and that's what david uh joel and i would do we would we would talk during the the broadcast about how much fun it was and how great it would be to do that we get really high thinking about that but if i'm really honest with myself deep down i had doubts okay because at some point i i I like to call it a tipping point at some point, you had to have had less doubt than desire. Yeah, I think the and way I would had, express it is I had more desire than I did before, and it drowned and out the doubt. Say, <laughs> yeah, and I was going to flip it over saying you started with more doubt than desire, and then at some point the doubt started to slow down. There was more desire, so you had a tipping point toward the desire. Yeah. And then, prob- yeah. And then as you had the desire be a, be a stronger vibration within you, that's what you were kind of sending out to the universe in a way that now thoughts were coming to you about what to do to expand and how to expand. Well, as you're saying that, I'm also realizing there was another factor that reduced the doubt. And the factor that reduced the doubt was from the point that David uh, joined me, during these last six months, we've had a tremendous increase, not just in subscribers, but downloads especially. You know, downloading a podcast. In fact, I sent you a graph about that before we did the show here today. Mm-hmm. And when I saw that, that was tangible evidence that it was time for me to take a step because I'm thinking, wow, okay, now I'm starting to get response here. I'm not even sure why I'm getting response, but I'm getting response now. Why not in the first four and a half years? I don't know, but now I'm getting response. I got to do something with it. And that's what started taking the doubt away. Well, have you heard of or seen the, the – There's a, I've seen a graphic. I have it actually on my wall of a, the glacier – and I like this as a metaphor, that a glacier is a gigantic block of ice. But Mm -hmm. the part that we see above the water is actually the smallest part because the biggest part is the foundational base. And that kind of also falls in line with when I think of things in terms of a tipping point. The tipping Mm -hmm. point is when it pops above the water. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do so much work foundationally in getting our – thoughts straight and getting our beliefs all moving in the right direction, removing resistance, removing doubt, removing insecurity, removing unworthiness, at least enough to the point that we can allow momentum to be built, moving us in a positive direction. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, that's actually what I'm... And when we get enough of that momentum... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish your thought. When we get enough of that momentum moving in a positive direction, then the manifestation is not just a, yeah, it's probably going to happen. It really becomes inevitable. It becomes a force that is so powerful that it kind of takes on a life of its own. Oh, it definitely does. No doubt about that. You know. Um, it, it, It takes on a life of its own so strongly that you don't even notice it's taken on a life of its own. You just go with it. You ju- you're right. You just go with it because you can't not. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it's all yeah. of your attention is now there. It's almost like you're, you're magnetized to it and you can't, you couldn't move away if you really wanted to. I mean, you could, but you don't want to try anyway. <laughs> right. Right. You know, and on the flip side, when you've had so much, like I know I've experienced this for me, I've had so much resistance in certain areas of my life that when I'm wanting to make a, a, a tangible move in a positive direction, it feels really hard, and I might get a little bit of movement where I can see it, and I'm like, oh, yay, and then I feel like I take three steps back. And that's, that's the point where in my world I'm really shifting how I view that because in, in one area in my life, um, you know, I have many conversations with my inner being, and I was asking, like, 
am I like missing it? Am I like doing something to thwart this? You know, do I just have too much resistance? And what I heard was kind of like just chill. It's moving in the right direction, but you have so much momentum moving in the wrong direction that it's going to take some time for the wrong direction momentum to slow down. It does. But once it does, yeah. Yeah, but once it does, you'll start to see movement in the other direction. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps as I say it. You know, (laughs) we'll start to move in the right direction, and then that will move with the same level of momentum and then some that the momentum going in the wrong direction was. Mm-hmm. And that's a concept I understood. And now, you know, and that's part of like when I went to Abraham's workshop on Saturday and having my friend come in yesterday and amplify my thoughts. It's like I'm really feeling and experiencing that, oh, I really have finally stopped the negative momentum in certain areas of my life. And I'm really starting to like grab hold of the new stuff and it's in motion. And that's what makes me feel like I'm like coming unglued. Because mm. I feel the motion, I know the motion. It's so in, like my dreams last night, I don't know what any of them specifically were, but every time I'd roll around in bed, I had this sense of powerful motion in the really? direction that I wanted. Yeah. And it's like, oh, this it, is good. And, and make, can you make it tangible? Like, what, what, what did that motion feel like? I mean, what did it feel like what was happening? It was, it was powerful. Uh, there's not a lot of words I can put around what it actually was, mm-hmm. but it felt powerful. Like I've had things in my life that feel kind of like flat, but this wasn't that. This didn't this feel flat like, at all. No, it was a growing, I'll say a growing knowing. <laughs> <laughs> it almost it sounds a like grow- a wave from the way you're describing it. You know, that I would say that would be very accurate. It, it felt kind of like an internal maybe a small tsunami taking place within me of things <laughs> small just tsunami. shifting. <laughs> a small one, not huge yet, but it was a small tsunami. <laughs> Isn't that a contradiction in terms, small tsunami? I mean, tsunami is big. <laughs> I know. Well, and I, this is just me being silly, but I'm thinking a tsunami would overtake me, Yes. a physical tsunami. Yes. But this one didn't overtake me, so that's why I called it the small tsunami because it was within me. So, so this is like a children's me. tsunami. <laughs> Let's just say this: I kept my 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 grounding and my footing, so it didn't knock me over. It's more like I was an oak tree who has rooting so solid in the ground that even when the big winds of a hurricane or a tsunami or whatever would push against it, it didn't it didn't move and it didn't get uprooted. It felt That's solid. Nice. That's nice. Yeah. That's really nice. And so that That's is a nice a- feeling. It's a good feeling. It's a great feeling. And it's, it's actually one of the things I'm hoping we can do as we expand the podcast. I want LOA Today to gain sort of a brand, if you will, of being the source for feeling good for people on a daily day basis, their, their daily dose of positivity, so to speak, where they come away from it hardly being able to wait for the next episode and having been set up with that that wave of feeling good that just carries them through the next part of their day. That's my, because, my ideal dream for the show. Because when they listen, they feel a sense of hope on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't wait w- to get Without more. the steroids, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I just don't, ha- I don't know a better way to, exp- I mean, because like, I think most of us know what hope is. But how you make it bigger than hope because I wasn't at ecstasy, I wasn't at enthusiasm, I wasn't, like, coming off unglued. But when I hit that point, to me, that was my tipping point when I was learning Law of Attraction. It's like I knew that it was hope, but it was so much more than hope. I just didn't really have the words for it. So that at the time, I came up with hope on steroids. <laughs> no, sure, yeah. Hey, whatever works in terms of uh, an analogy is fine. Are, are you familiar with the work of Sean Aker? No, I'm not. Okay. Sean was a graduate student who worked with one of the um, main professors in the uh, nascent beginnings of the Department of Positive Psychology at Harvard University. And he wrote a book a number of years ago called The Happiness Advantage, in which he details 
the results of, of many studies that have been done by people in the positive psychology movement, which is a very new movement, and how they have discovered a number of keys to understanding why it is that some people succeed, why some fail, why some get their dreams, why some don't get their dreams. If, if you were to actually corner Sean about law of attraction, he would resist it and he would dismiss it. But the stuff that they produce from their their scientific inquiry into positive psychology so closely mirrors LOA that there's really no point in pretending that there's any difference between them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one of the things that Sean emphasizes in his book, The Happiness Advantage, which came out so oh, roughly six, seven years ago, something like that, is that happiness precedes success. In other words, those people who look for success in order to produce happiness in their lives are almost always, not just usually or not just occasionally, almost always disappointed by it because they find that the success does not produce happiness. In fact, what usually happens is that when people among the, the, the minority who do achieve some success, they find that once they get there, the goalposts have been moved. And now there's another success they have to achieve. And then there's another one beyond that. And they never actually get to happiness. On the other side of the coin, those people who, for whatever reason, either because of upbringing or environment or their own personal orientation as who they are as a human being, they, they take the positive high road and, and all they're interested in is feeling good in the moment. Those are the ones who are more likely to feel success and experience success over the long haul of their life. In fact, one of the studies he cites is a fascinating study. It's called the Nun Study. It was basically a study of journals and essays written by nuns starting, I'm going to guess, around 1929, 1930, because around that time, the U.S. Diocese of the Catholic Church, um, the mother superior of that uh, organization, put out a missive to all of the different um, nunneries, if you will, the nun schools around the country, and gave the order that all novitiates were to make a record of where they came from in their lives, where they were right now, and what they were hoping to accomplish. And a large chunk of these were saved over the years. These positive psychologists found out about this treasure trove of information, and they asked permission of the Catholic Church in the United States to um, follow up with the novitiates who actually had become nuns and compare what happened in their lives to what they were writing in their journals. One of the things that they did in the course of this study was they had a panel of people who were blind to what the study was trying to do, and, and they were, the panel was just given the journals and asked to grade them on a scale of like one to five or something like that, Five being where they thought that the person who, writing the who was writing the journal was doing some from a very positive viewpoint, one being where they were writing from a very negative viewpoint, three being somewhere in between, and so forth. And so they graded them and basically broke them up into five categories. And what they found is that when they compared the results of the novitiates who originally were scored as a five to those who were scored as a one, the novitiates who were scored as a five lived an average of 20 to 25 years longer. Wow. Now, can, and the five was the implies? one that came, and the five equaled the positive viewpoint, the positive. is that right? So the ones who had a positive outlook on life, their outlook at, in their early 20s predicted how long their life was going to be. Interesting. It also had other similar kinds of results that came out of it. The ones who were more in the positive range ended up having more success in their lives. They achieved more of their goals. The ones who scored at the lower end and toward the one end of the range were the ones who got sick. They were the ones who had the dread diseases more often than the other groups were. I mean, it, there were like all these different things that happened over the, the long course of these nuns' lives that were directly predicated by what they were feeling in their 20s. That's <laughs> fascinating. Well, you know, that, that makes me think of, you know, now that I'm in my 50s, um, People who meet me have no idea how old I am because I look a lot younger than what I really am chronologically. And the more I've been hearing this lately, the more it's caused me to remember um, 
something that I, I started believing about myself probably in my early 20s. For whatever reason, and I don't even remember what was the catapult or the, the uh, whatever, the thing that caused me to think this, but I had this idea that the older I got, the more youthful I'd become. Okay. And that I would live a very long, healthy life, and I would be so youthful that nobody would ever know how old I was because I didn't act or sound or look my chronological age. And I'm noticing my peers, you know, on many kinds of drugs in order to, like, you know, for to regulate their blood pressure or other thyroid things or whatever. And, you know, if I go to a doctor for some reason, you know how you have to fill out, um, you know, what your health survey, your, your health history is? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't have anything to check. <laughs> and I'm like one of the only people I know that I'm not on any medication. I'm not even on any supplements for any deficiency. And I... I thought about I've thought about this quite a lot and I went I don't know what caused me to like put that thought into my my cooker if you will but I have believed it all of my life every time I think about getting older I always think about and I'm becoming more youthful and so that's really amazing to me that yeah. kind of fits into the nun study it does because it really does since I was, although since there's I was also very the flip young. side too there's a flip side, too, which is you hear about the nun study and you say, well, gee, I was always pretty negative when I was a kid. I must be in trouble. But that's not true either, because they also have another study that was done by one of the other professors of positive psychology at Harvard. She did this study back in the late 1970s. And in this study, she had invited a group of older men, men in their 60s and 70s, to participate in a one-week uh, exercise, I guess you'd call it. She pre-screened all of them, and she she broke them up into two groups. There was a control group, and there was the test group. <clears throat> the control group, she just invited them to come and put them into a room, and they just spent the week together. There was no instructions or anything like that. The second group, and in both cases, she took medical histories and gave them exams and so forth because she wanted to test all these different things. The second group, the test group, she got them into the room after they had, or to the, the facility after they had passed all their screening and said, okay, for the next week, I want you to pretend that you are the same person you were back in the 1950s, so 20 years before. And she gave them all name badges that had their pictures from when they were 20 years younger. And she filled the facility with like 1950s Life magazines and Time magazines and pictures of President Eisenhower on the wall and music from the 50s playing in the background. And then she just left them through their devices for, for a week. And, you know, they just lived together. They did things together. They took meals together and so on and so forth. At the end of the week, she ran them through a battery of tests again, the same test that she had done the first time, both groups. Here's what she got out of uh, the test results. The test results showed that the test group who went through the deliberate planned week like that, mm-hmm. they – acted younger. They got rid of a lot of their symptoms. If they had illnesses of some kind, um, they became more spry. They were physically more able to do things. They they tested physically stronger. The most amazing one is they tested a 10% improvement in eyesight. (laughs) Wow. After one week. (laughs) One week. Wow. (laughs) Boy, if that is not a perfect example for what you focus on, you get more of yeah. it. I don't yeah. know what is. Uh, that, that was one of the most astonishing. In fact, that's, that um, study is considered so controversial within psychology quarters that there are large chunks of what I'll call the negative psychology crowd, which is, you know, the larger dysfunctionality crowd, you know, the ones that train psychotherapists and so forth. There's a large chunk of that crowd that refuses to accept the results. I believe that. <laughs> they, they, they just won't. They, they, there's, there's, there was something wrong. The, the, the study was was poisoned. There was something not right about the way she did it. You, the, the results are invalid. <laughs> no one's ever reproduced wow. it. You know, whatever. All these objections. Yeah. But nevertheless, that, that's what she produced. That is a very cool study. I'd never heard of that one. I don't think I'd ever yeah. heard of the nun one either. Those are those are two really cool studies. 
The, the second one is cited in, in Sean's book, The Happiness Advantage. I strongly recommend the book. It's a, it, it's a dull read in some ways, but the information in it, once you can get past the dullness, is really good. Really, <laughs> really good. And among other things, it validates a lot of the things that Abraham Hicks and the, SC, uh, uh, the LOA crowd um, advocate, things like journaling and gratitude and, uh, you know, uh, telling something nice to somebody, you know, random acts of kindness, that kind of thing. Those activities actually have, they have been able to document within the, the positive psychology scientific circles. They've been able to document actual improvements in measured ways that show that those methodology, methodologies actually produce positive results. Well, you know, that reminds me, um, years ago when I was um, doing a number of Tony Robbins seminars, one of the things that he talked about um, is something called transformation vocabulary. Have you ever heard of okay. that? I re- recognize um, the term, but it's been a while since I've done anything Tony Robbins, so you'll have to remind me. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, just in a, in a nutshell, basically, you know, he talks about how the words that we use – to describe what our experiences are matter. Mm. And, for example, um, I'll use it from a negative perspective purposefully. If we use negative words on a regular basis, such as, you know, anger and frustrated and, you know, hatred and things like that, without recognizing it, oftentimes we're bringing more of that into our life. And so one of the small little things, and, I mean, it is small, but it takes some practice, is he calls his transformational vocabulary where if you take a word that you use on a regular basis that really isn't serving you like if you're saying angry i'm angry at this person and this person really ticked me off and i'm so angry at them if you could find a word not that goes all the way to the other end of the spectrum like love because that's just way too extreme but something that just lessens it a little bit Mm -hmm. it could soften your experience sure so i've done this with clients and sometimes I've heard them go from angry to pissed off. And if for them, that's less that's extreme, an okay. <laughs> you know, for some, they'll go from angry to... Because they're to it, which is good. <laughs> yeah, or they'll say ticked off. Okay, that's a little bit, you know, less. Tony's example, which I thought was really clever, because it's what came to him, is he called it, um, I think he said annoyed. So instead okay, of saying that he was having an experience with someone where they made them he made them angry, he just said they I was really annoyed. Mm-hmm. And over time, by removing the word anger and using a softer word, their experience of that extreme negativity also lessened. Right. And so I've yes. used that over the last twenty years since I learned that, and I have found that to be very true. It really because it changes my point of focus. And it's not so extreme. And in the moment the experience happens, I actually have a, because I'm not so out there on the ragged edge of, ah, you know, (laughs) I'm able to make a better choice in how I respond. And so, I mean, all of of this, all of this to me has to do with law of attraction because it's all, where do we, where do we place our focused attention? You know, um, here's a fun, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, tell your story. Go ahead. I was going to say, years ago, I decided to remove the word mistake from my vocabulary. Because Tony okay. says, if you don't have a word to describe something, you can't experience it. Well, I didn't know if that was true, so I thought, I'm going to test it. So I caught myself using the word mistake often, because I was a hyper-perfectionist, and so if I made a mistake, it was really a big deal to me. So <laughs> I removed the word, and I had I to find different I know something about that, ways. by the way. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> So it's not like mistakes never happened, but because of this challenge I put before myself, I'd had to find different ways to express it. And so different things started showing up in my life. So if something was, quote, a mistake, I'd say, well, there was a slight error in judgment. Or it wasn't (laughs) all that it was cracked up to be. Or, you know, it's not as good, but I'm going to take another stab at it. I'm going to work on it again and, and see what else I can come up with. And because I found all these different ways to talk about it, again, it wasn't the extreme of going to like, oh, now I'm doing everything right and it's all perfect. But what it did is it softened my, I didn't know this at the time, but it softened my self-judgment. I was Mm. so critical of myself when I made a mistake. It was almost like stabbing myself in the heart because I thought I was a horrible, unworthy person because I made a mistake. Mm. 
Mm, and now yeah. without the word mistake, I actually, if I say, well, it looks like there was some error in this calculation, it actually made me giggle, which definitely shifted my point of attraction. <laughs> and after about 10 years, I felt like, you know what, the experiment worked. I now do use the word mistake when I want to, but it kind of always makes me laugh because yeah. – it doesn't have the horrible charge on it that it once did. And so that's one of my fun little tools with people, especially if I'm working with a client and I hear them use the same repetitive word, you know, I'm like, okay, that word is really not serving them. So I teach them about transformational vocabulary, and we talk about what, what's a little bit softer word that you could use just to replace this, and let's just try it for three days and see what happens. And it reminds me of tried it. Yeah, anyone who's tried it has had a good experience with it. Which is great. It reminds me of the classic story of Thomas Edison inventing the light bulb. And usually that story is told in terms of he failed 10,000 times and then he finally succeeded in inventing the light bulb. Mm -hmm. But the way that I like hearing that story the most and the one that stuck with me best is the one where he was interviewed about it. And I don't remember the exact wording, but the gist of it was the interviewer asked him about all the failures he had um, with his attempts to invent the, light, the electric light bulb. And his response was to stop the interviewer right there and say, no, I didn't have failures. What I did was I found 10,000 different ways not to invent the light bulb. Mm -hmm. And there's a really subtle difference in there, but that subtle is. difference makes a world of difference. I was going to say that subtle difference makes the difference between somebody stopping and quitting versus continuing on their path because they know success is inevitable. Right. <laughs> now, I'm and not I sure like I could stick it out to do it 10,000 times. but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but, you know, I do like the idea of, and this is kind of like a phrase in my life, success for me is inevitable as long as I never give up. That's true. That's very true. Listen, we're down to about our last minute here. Um, one thing we always like to do is to invite uh, listeners who are interested in contacting our our guest expert or our co-host expert, how to reach you. So if somebody wants to get some coaching from you, how do they do it? It's pretty easy. All they do is go online and go to my website, wendydillard.com. Wendy is spelled with a Y, wendydillard.com. My email is there. My phone number is there. What I do is there. You'll learn a little bit more about Law of Attraction and my style and my story and um, anybody who wants to contact me, I would be more than happy to, like, you know, have have a conversation and see if we're a fit. And, and Dillard, of course, is two L's, D-I-L-L-A-R-D. So contact yes, Wendy. I like this. My name is, like, double retail. Wendy, like Wendy's hamburgers, and Dillard, like Dillard's department store. <laughs> oh, there you go. You won't forget Wendy, it. it. Wendy Dillard. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that is completely unforgettable, and so are you. I, I have totally enjoyed having you on the program. I'm looking forward Thank to having you. you back again. Thanks for joining us. This is a blast. I love just having a conversation. What a, what a riot! Who ever thought you could do a podcast by just chit chatting? But that's kind of what we did. <laughs> We're <laughs> going to do a lot more of it. And, yeah, We're going to do absolutely. a whole lot more of it. So thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll look forward to having you all join us too next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.